two. See you sucker soon on a hot summer day. Coffee comes back in a nerve-wracking way. The dishes and laundry take the garbage out. What a day, what a day, what a day. Welcome to Capital Region Today. I'm Ann Perrill, your host and producer of Capital Region Today, and I am so excited. We've got great lineup today. I say that every time, but I really mean it. We have such great guests on this show. Today we're going to be talking with Pasta Mama, that's Denise Arasi Ritz, and we're going to see some Italian Easter treats and find out how she makes them, and I might even take a taste or two. You never know. And then we're going to be going over to the Iroquois Indian Museum and learning about their upcoming uh, events that will be coming up starting in the spring and going right out through the summer and into the fall. It's a great place to bring your kids to learn about other cultures, and, and actually they, they're here before us, so we got to pay, learn a little bit more about them. Um, and then we've got the Bunbury Players on talking about their one-act plays and who, what types of plays are going to be and how many nights it is. Lots of good stuff going over there. And uh, then we're going to be talking about fraud. Okay, it's the gentleman, uh, Todd Singerlin, is from Wealth One, but he's going to talk about how you can kind of figure out what's a fraud and which isn't. So, and I've got some questions for him too, so we've got lots of stuff going on. But right now, going over to our other stage area, we have Denise Rossi Ritz, and she's also known as Pasta Mama. To see you yeah, again. Good. Thanks for having me back. And she brought my favorite food because I, you know, as an Italian, Easter was the best. Christmas, eh, it was okay. Right. We had the wandi and we had the struffle and things like that. But Easter was it. And why is Easter good? Because we make all the yummy pies and cookies. Everything's done homemade by hand. And it just has that special flavor. As you know, growing up Italian. Lemon, it's citron. It's flavor that just, you know it's Easter. Yeah. I yeah. think somebody said when I took the top off, they said, and that's you can exactly tell it's Easter. what you want. It's and Easter. the Easter bread. Right. Yeah. It's and it's, and somebody bread. says, oh, that's just challah, challah bread. And I go, well, it is, but it isn't. It it's is because bread. we got more flavor. The Italians like to get a little, maybe a little anisette in there or something like that. Yeah, we always throw a little of that in. Yeah, I know that one of the things is when I talk about to people about our Easter, and I say, oh yeah, we make Easter pies. We make the cheese, you know, the ragatha pie. We make the pizza game, which is with ham and sausage. And they go, that doesn't sound very sweet. Right, it doesn't. But when they try it, they're like, it doesn't wow. have to be sweet, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, good. So, so what, what do you brought now? And I, these look just like my mom's. Oh, yeah. thank you. That mean, and that means a lot because knowing the work it takes to achieve one pie, let alone what we do at Easter, it just, it comes from the heart. And you, and you have to be careful because they'll sink if you don't do it or right. Fat. And you've got to use the, the, the pan that, you, you know. You have to use good ingredients. And that's what I pride myself on. Uh, my mom, I mean, it's everything I know, I grew up doing at two years old, so I kind of yeah. just Me too, right it. at my mother's knee. Yeah. Well, no, not at my mother's table. <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid, it was a specialty to be able to be in the kitchen with my mom and my aunts and my gram. You know, from the Italian food is one thing, but Easter was such a thing. You know, aside from making our homemade pastas, so we... What I brought today is what was a specialty for us. Okay, well, let's start over here with the cookies. Okay. Those, I, I would say those look, I mean, those are great, great. I love them. But those also are what we, my mom would call bride cookies. Yeah, a lot of people call them wedding cookies. Some people over the years have called them rosettes. But they're, they're a wedding cookie. Yeah. Um, I put a little bit of the anise in Oh, you got to put the anise. Yeah. So I call them anginettes. Okay. And they're strictly like if you were to pull up the recipe, it's that but plus my twist. I Are these say, your mom's recipes or, your, or did you devise them? So it starts out with my mom's recipes that I remember like 30 years ago moving into my own apartment and writing my mom's recipes down. But we still talk about food. Like well, she lives in Florida now, so we still talk two, three times a day. It's always about food. And the kids, of course. Yeah. But um, oh, the kids? I, <laughs> I know, right? Um, but it's there. It's the traditional recipe, but I call it with a twist. Okay. Because that's what I do. I may not do everything by the strict Italian rules like some, you know, 
of the different kinds of families, depending where you're from, are very strict with ingredients. I just say it's traditional with a twist. Yeah. So well, these... it, what's funny is that I don't know about your mom's recipe, mm -hmm. but my mom would say, "Well, you take about so much flour, and then you put the egg, and then you knead it until well until it fills right, right, or until it comes off the sides, yeah, or yeah. you know, a palm, a pinch." You know, all those really do come into play. So I have started writing out recipes, but it takes me time to do so because especially like if I'm doing yeah, what's something What's a pinch? Like, <laughs> right, if I'm doing something like stuffed artichokes. Which oh, I love stuffed artichokes. I mean, if you've seen on social media, I just posted a video about that. And it's, it's tricky because a lot of it's just this, that, how it feels, the texture. The taste but it can still be written in a recipe which I have yeah, yeah. See, I don't have a recipe for my stuffed artichoke I put the capers in and I, I use anchovies and a little you know mm, cheese and oh, stuff. yeah that sounds so good yeah so it's so I don't have a recipe I just kind of oh, like I chop some garlic and I do that and then I throw that in and I do and that's exactly how I started and then it turned into people wanting recipes and it just became a thing like my name and kind of like what I do so I do write it into recipes now if people want to ask. And eventually I'll get that website. That'll come in time. I'm always working with my hands. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get to that Well, stuff. are you going to be one of those uh, those people that puts up a recipe and leaves one of the ingredients out because you don't want anybody to know no, exactly? No, because it, I feel it would reflect on me, just like how I cook. I care about, obviously, if you look, at detail. Okay, so, let's, so we talked about the, the I, I call them the bride cookies, rosettes. Yeah, what what do you want to call them? I call them anginettes. So it's... A basic recipe, but with a twist. Okay, I can't help it. Keep talking. And I, of course, decorate oh. every single tray I do. So when you get something from me, you know it's going to be decorated because it goes back to... <laughs> Those are amazing. Thank you. Those are just like my mom's. Oh, my gosh. I love that. I love... My favorite compliment isn't oh so God. much oh, about so how good the food is. <laughs> it's more about somebody telling me that it tastes like their mom's or it tastes like their grams or it reminds me of their great aunt. And that's what I love to do. That's what I bring to people and I bring to their houses is that home cooking, not so much the strict chef. I'll just throw whatever in it. Hey, I decide to change things up, and this is what I'm doing this the time. The texture on these cookies is Each one is done perfect. by hand. We don't... We No, the roll. texture is perfect. Thank you. Because sometimes you get them, and they're really kind of dry and stuff. Right. That's why I never buy them out. So it's funny you say that because my son, he's 23 now, and when he was working with me back 10 years ago when I kind of went off on this venture, um, I would have him roll cookies a specific mm -hmm. way, and sometimes if I'm rushing doing other things, I'll come and do a couple. And Mom, that's not tight enough. <laughs> there you go. But these so are, it these reminds are amazing. Me, and my daughter's 14 now, and now she just she takes over. Like she did, the, she rolled all the cookies. She chopped these, up these all are, the. I, I gotta say because I've had these, and you know, like yeah. I get a craving and I buy them in the store. I make my own. But right. I buy them in the store, but it's and it's nice like. To have, oh, well, people say they cook, but it's nice to have somebody come and do it for you, too. It's like going to get your hair done or any other treatment that you get done. It's a treat. Yeah. You know? So now we're going to talk okay. about the three pies, which are not sweet. They're actually a pie that's Very served. Very savory. Yeah, and we usually, I don't serve it like after dinner sometimes. See, this is what I did to display. So if you ever got a pie from me, you'll see it comes in a nine-inch deep pan. So the pan can actually be, you just, it's an aluminum pan, so you could just cut it right off. Yeah. The pie is so firm, you could just place it on a tray. And then how we cut it, because it can be served as a breakfast item, it mm -hmm. can be served as a snack. Somebody comes over and you give a little piece. It's not like you're no, going you to cut you don't, no, a cut triangle like a piece of, no, oh my no, God, no, no, that'd no. be so much because they're so no, rich. No, no, I mean, you're talking no. butter, heavy cream, real real hearty good regal i mean you're talking your good stuff the good stuff yeah and we're not hence, talking about skim stuff right so when you get a pie so this one here is the rice which of course has I risotto love the rice it. yeah it's not just rice it's risotto yeah and it's sat and savored and i cook it in milk you put citron in that no actually my rice pie i've diverted like i said okay, yeah. before i do a little bit of cinnamon Cinnamon. Okay, yeah. Just Cinnamon's a touch. Good. Not yeah. a lot. It's not rice pudding. Yeah, yeah. But if you see, the this one's the rice pie. You could see, because I yeah. made another pie to cut it so you can see yeah, what no, it looks, looks like good. on the inside. And then this is the regatta pie. 
and as you it's can not tell, a cheesecake it's per not se. a cheese no it is not a cheesecake it is a very rich it's got a lot of dense, eggs in it and, stuff. and i do right what you see on top i do the fresh lemon zest lemon zest and the orange zest and that just makes it just pop yeah and then of course now when you make the pizza game now we used to use three three meats in it mm -hmm. one was like the cured sausage the mm -hmm. air air cured sausage mm -hmm. the ham and the prosciutto right so I don't do sausage, okay. I just do the prosciutto. Because it's hard to find that sausage anyway. Yeah, I just do the prosciutto and, and I use baked ham. Okay. So it's really good quality meats, as okay. you could tell. Um, I mean, each pie weighs between three and four pounds. Oh yeah, 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 just, yeah. They're, they're not light. <laughs> right, right. And so of course- She carried them in all by herself. No, my son actually <laughs> came because I knew from last year. So I said, honey, can you come? And he knows, he's yeah. always my, Again, he's 23, he's still my little boy. Of course. Um, so that's the meat pie. And so when you, and again, you cut into that and you can see, I mean, it's kind of heavy to lift and show the camera. Yeah. Um, you're, every bite you take, you're gonna get ham, prosciutto, you're gonna get the cheeses, you're gonna There's get the eggs that in it. Yeah. Oh, each pie probably has, let's see, six it's or a seven lot. eggs. Yeah, not it, only it's that. It's a lot of stuff in one pie. And it takes time. It's a, tra it, it's a tradition. It's a tradition. Yeah. And we really slave over it. But it became like people wanted pies and they started ordering from me. And, you know, you can go to any of the Italian delis and get pies. But this is what it's going to look like if, you know, you were to have me cook it. Yeah. So yeah, I say wonderful. from my kitchen to yours. And yeah. it's all just happy home cooking. So. And now the Easter bread. I and love Easter course, bread. Oh, the Easter my God. bread. Right. The Easter bread was always the biggest treat for us. Oh, and breakfast, breakfast. You have to have oh, Easter bread. For and sometimes, you know, you put a, just a little bit butter. of butter. <laughs> Why not make it more rich with like the ton yeah, of butter? Yeah, it's not rich it? enough. Let's add butter. And, and then again, you're talking heavy cream. You're talking the butter. You're talking the sugar. It's wonderful. But it's such a treat. And I decorate it like, and again, if you get something from me, it's going to have candy because the candy now goes back to my grandmother who always had a candy drawer. And all us grandkids always loved, we would always get candy and she would fill it just for us. And I became a candy lover. And no, hence it's now it's part of my family, something I did in my past and I bring it to my plates now. Ribbons, candy, I mean, I have a whole room full of candies decorative and ribbons candy. and decorative, decorative stuff. Yeah. And, it would, like you see, I do on my cakes, yeah. and I, you know, that's another fun thing I like to do. Now we showed some pictures, I think, of some of the things that she's made. But just because we're looking at the Easter treats, uh, she also does um, regular food. Yeah. And you do uh, birthday cakes, so mm -hmm. you do them all. And yeah. I don't know how you. When do you sleep? <laughs> I find time somewhere along the line. Yeah. Might be on the couch because I know I have to go right into the kitchen. But yeah, I think there's they, always time. I just showed some. Yeah, let's show. Yeah, let's look at some of those pictures. Yeah, they're just wonderful. And, and again, it's just food that I grew up with that I fell into this type of work. And, you know, the story goes, I met somebody in, in a backyard party and he asked me to cook for him and it became a thing. He named me Pasta Mama and it became a thing. And here you're either, I am, you 10 either, years later, cooking my mom's food. You either for everybody. love to cook or you don't. And you know, and we, you and I are cookers. Exactly. And then, you know, you up it when you're cooking for 100 people. But of course, it just, it's not a problem for me. I never knew I had it in me. I might have done it, you know, 30 years ago when I was looking, you know, figuring out what I was going to do in my career. Um, well, she does have a, a card that if you were here in the room, you can see the card. And she's pasta mama, and she uh, says home, home, homemade Italian foods. And yeah, believe me, she does it. it. She yeah. does a dinner. She cater. You do everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I come right to your house, and I will cook the food right at your house. Home style. Everything is home style. Everything is, you know, I'm in the kitchen, and I talk to your guests and have fun with it. And I end up becoming somebody's distant cousin, and Why we just not? have fun, right? It's just all about fun. I don't do it to be, oh my gosh, you have to eat this with this. It's all just fun food. Food brings people together. You smile when you eat food. I have so many, mem I'm always talking about old memories and growing up as a kid. Things there's that always I- stories. There's always stories, and even with my kids, I they tell stories because they hear my stories constantly, and it's just, became a thing. Right. And so here's where I put my heart and soul. Well, I, I'm telling you, your heart and soul is right on the table here. And I got to say, these cookies are amazing. And I can't wait to try the rest afterwards. 
Thank um, you. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you I for mean, I mean, me I just again. love talking to you because I mean, I, okay, she's one of my new relatives. <laughs> see, one of my new relatives. See, through food, you find distant cousins, or you make them. Absolutely, the ones absolutely. you get to choose. Yeah. So, no, this thank is you great. So much. Yeah. I thank you so much it. for for bringing your treats to for our audience to try. Anyway. Now you even brought takeout containers. For oh, okay. People. okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, thank I'm you. I'm gonna kind of walk. I'm taking my cookie with me, by the way. It's so good. That's okay. I just want to get rid of my microphone there. Okay, with me now, we're going to be talking about the Iroquois Museum over in House Cave. And I've been there. I love that museum. And I love it because I learned so much. It's not just artifacts sitting there. What you do is you explain. One of the things that I learned, which you're probably going to laugh, is that if an, a Native American woman marries an American, she's no longer Native American. What is with that? What is with that? I'm telling you, that just well, it floored me. It, it depends whether you're living in Canada oh, okay. or you're living in um, the U.S. It depends on what community you come from. It can they make happen. their own rules. It can happen. They have their rules, and uh, it doesn't always happen. Okay. We're talking with Christina Hank. She is the president, the board president of the Iroquois uh, Museum. And uh, with her, I've got, Stephanie's been on the show a number of times. Nice to She's be back. She's the director, and, I, and she puts on, I don't know who plans all of the events, but you have amazing events. I love your, you know, the dancers. I mean, I even got out there and was dancing That's with good. them, and That's I was good. learning a little bit. They got the great moves, you know. <laughs> Well, thank you. It's a group effort. We have a, we have a great staff and a great board and great volunteers. And every year we just think about it and say, well, what can we do? Try to do something a little bit different. Try to do something that we know people enjoy. And it's just nice to bring the Iroquois back every year. And uh, you kind of make friends over the years after 40 years doing this. Okay. Now, is there an Iroquois community close by? Or tell me a little bit about, I know the, the museum is not on Native American land. I don't want to use the word reservation. I hate that word. I'm sorry, but you know, on Native American land, because this is all Native American mm -hmm. land. Let's face it. Um, but do they have a community? Absolutely. Okay. There tell are us some, about it. some 19 communities, some on original territory. If you drive through on Route 81 from Syracuse south, you go right through the Onondaga Reservation. Okay. Um, it's really a territory. It's always been their land. It always and it, <laughs> it still is. What can I say? <laughs> but um, most of the Mohawks are either up north of us, up along the St. Lawrence, or they're over. I know that they, they have a um, community or a reservation. I think they, they have. I that's all right. That you word. can call community. I, it's reserve. A, yeah, I know. I hate that word. But, okay. you know, it's like up there because um, I, they it, have four. It, yeah, because I had a student, I, when I taught at the College of Pharmacy, I had a student that was a Mohawk. Okay. And so he was up there, um, and I know that there was an issue about land and stuff, and he was involved with that as well. Absolutely. So I, I'm quite familiar with that. Right. Yeah. So even um, where the people I'm sure know about the Turning Stone Casino. Oh, gee, yeah. There's Oneida <laughs> land there. You go towards the uh, towards Buffalo. There's Allegheny, Cattaraugus, Tonawana. Those are Seneca communities. And then you go all the way over into Ontario. There's a Six Nations Reserve. So yes, there is territory. Iroquois continue now to have territory. Now the Turning Stone is on their own land, right? Yes. Okay. Right. And they continue to get. Uh, they continue to want to bring their land back. Um, As they're, they're, well, they should. <laughs> right. Um, I'm sure they get pushback, but I'm yeah. sure that, you know, it's... I mean, they're Oneida who live in Wisconsin. They live in uh, Ontario. And it's all about what happened um, when the Europeans came here, how, what the movement, uh, what happened after the Revolutionary just, War, just, and... Um, I so. have a lot of trouble with, with, you know, what the Europeans did, but anyways. But I well, used to go to the Potawatomi oh, uh, in, in the Midwest, the Potawatomi... Uh, events were amazing and well, I've been to the ones in Canada too good good that's why we have the museum in uh, Schoharie County we started out in Schoharie the village of Schoharie it was uh, to be a teaching museum but also to promote the artists the craftspeople the performers and to really understand 
who are the people who love this area first by looking it through their creativity, through their artwork, their craft work, and then we continue to do that today. And um, I was just thinking, since 1982, the Jim Sky Dancers, they're a group who you would see at our festival, always Labor Day weekend, have come to every single festival we've had. So we have met their children, and now their children are parents, or they're even grandparents now. We've just had such a very long and wonderful relationship um, with the Six Nations and, and with Iroquois. Well, you mentioned Chihuahua Six Nations. Area. What are those Six Nations? Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Tuscarora. No, oh, I didn't mention yeah, the Seneca. Don't forget the Seneca. Oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, go. you know, uh, when was it? Saturday night, there were a couple of Onondaga guys. Uh, and At the uh, lacrosse, lacrosse uh, game, the game. Firewolves, Albany Firewolves. Okay. Yeah. And a uh, number of Native players that play. But, but you, you didn't mention Hadashani. Well, tell me about that. What's that? Well, the Haudenosaunee. Did I even pronounce it right? Yeah, you close. did, Haudenosaunee. <laughs> it was cl uh, close enough. <laughs> that is their name in their language. Oh, and really? And in various languages, it is, uh, it is pronounced a little differently. So it isn't Iroquois? No. Well, well yeah, they're, well. They're, their name is, Iroquois is a name that we've given them. We've given it to them. Who did that? Well, it's kind of a French Algonquin mixture. Oh, and, okay. And it was not a... Uh, a good term initially. It means something like snakes or something. Oh, like. that so, was nasty. Because the Algonquins didn't get along with the Iroquois. Oh, so, so they yeah. just, yeah, well, and yeah. Then, we do that now, don't we? <laughs> it's like everybody named Let's stop that. Right. <laughs> but, so that's why, uh, you know, it, it's the name we recognize the group as, but for themselves, it's Haudenosaunee, which means basically people who built the longhouse, which are the traditional longhouses that they, that they lived in. So it kind of, we, we try to get that in. We say Iroquois so people know who we're talking about, but then it's like, but Haudenosaunee is the, the name, uh, the preferred name. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know the museum, and, I, and I, I urge you, if you have not been to the museum, please go, because it's such enlightening to go there and, I mean, you know, we see words like Indian, Native American, but until you actually go into a museum and you see the artwork and you see the persecution, I mean, that's addressed. The other thing that's addressed is the negative advertising and things, there's so much, it's, you know, we don't even realize what we've no. done until you bring it to our attention and we realize that we weren't very nice. And I use that collectively because I don't think I was mean, but who you knows, you know. Well, I encourage people to come to the museum because you are going to meet Iroquois. Um, Brenda LaFour is, uh, she's on Adaga. She's a fantastic educator. Mike Tarbell is Mohawk. He also is a wonderful educator. And then when we have <clears throat> our dancers or people come to demonstrate, that's when you get to meet a variety of people. Yeah, absolutely. And very friendly, very talkative. And they want to teach, and they want to explain. There's so much about warmth. Who they are. There's so Absolutely. much warmth there. I, that's the word I want to use. There's so much warmth. You just feel, you know, it's like when they started dancing, and they come, you know, yes. come join me. And it's like, oh, I don't think I can do that. Oh, you know, it's sort of like um, it's welcoming. And it could be just the opposite, saying, look what you did to us, and I don't want to even mean, you know. But yeah. it, it hasn't. You know, it's like we want you to learn about us yep. and what we've done. And I'm going to look at your, your program. You've got uh, an exhibition from April to November. What is that exhibition? Well, we try to do something different every year. And this year we're looking at three of the early um, Iroquois painters. There's a couple Seneca guys and I believe Jim Beaver was Cayuga. He was very early. He was uh, late 1800s. And it's just looking at sort of a non-traditional medium for Iroquois artists, um, and it's particularly early on. It's a more of a, a European style. Mm -hmm. And the one man, Ernest Smith, is a Seneca painter, and he did a lot of paintings that show the traditions of, of the, his culture, 
and also a lot of the stories. So we're going to revolve a lot will be around the various stories, which are a lot of fun. It's yeah. Stone giants and flying heads. And well, that's, no, but that, that, so that's, it's going to be a fun exhibit. Yeah, that, that's really a, a, a great. I know you've done you know many other things. You did uh, different ones. Um, and you have an opening reception, okay, and on Saturday the 27th, we're getting towards uh, the holidays there, the artist demonstration, hand tool leather work. That's the first time he'll be Native here. Native Americans are excellent at leather work. Mm -hmm. like and beading, A lot of deer there. Yeah. Make, make stuff out of the deer. I, uh, yeah, exactly. You know, clothing as well as other uh, heads for drums, because the water drum has a leather head. So this is the first time that we'll have this artist there, and um, we'll see what he has to show us. Now, here's an interesting, Ernie Smith and the WPA Project. Okay, now that was the, during World War II, the WPA yes, was. Yes, that was Roosevelt, okay. and, and two of the artists that are the featured artists in this exhibit, Ernie Smith and um, Jesse Cornplanter, were at that time part of the WPA Project. And so a lot of the paintings that, particularly, I know more about Ernie Smith, particularly that he created were at the, in essence, at the behest of the WPA, it put him to work. That's where they were also. planting trees. They were doing. Uh -huh. My grandfather was involved with some of that planting trees up in Saratoga. They did the yeah. the the Avenue of the Pines was all put yes. in by WPA. Yeah. And this was all about Native art and traditions and and helping to I'm keep that going. I'm glad they did that. Yeah. yeah. I was not aware that they had included the. Yeah. Uh, that the that was started by Arthur Parker who is the director of the Rochester Museum, and when they got money, they got monies for the dub from the WPA, that's what he decided needed to be Which was done. smart, yeah. which was a smart thing and to do. And he was a well. Seneca. He was a Seneca nation. Okay, here we go. How to Shawnee, I did say that right, isn't it? How to Shawnee? <laughs> yeah. Stories and Mohawk illustrator and storyteller. Wow. Yeah, he's a young guy. We worked with him a couple years ago on a, on, we could, after COVID, we created a lot of online uh, videos and learning experiences, and he came down and did some stories for us then. So we wanted to have him back and actually be able to do stories in front of an audience. And he's a, he's a young guy. He's into sort of uh, uh, graphic um, novel kind of things, that kind yeah, of, that yeah, kind of I graphics. Know and, mean, uh, yeah. So it's, it's a different look for a real traditional storyteller that we were used to. So it'll be fun to have him back and have yeah, do his I mean, own take on it. it. We're not always going back to the early it's not all traditional or something right. like that. <laughs> um, you talked about Six Nations, um, and I guess my question is: Was there a rivalry between the nations? I know in in Italy, community two towns are always in rivalry. So I'm just wondering whether, um, when you talk to Six Nations, were they pretty okay with each other? Not initially, okay. and that in essence is why there are now a grouping of five, started out with five nations and now uh, six with the Tuscarora, but they had been warring with each other. And um, there's a fantastic story that they tell about how they brought, um, each of the nations came together and they planted a tree of peace, put the uh, weapons of war underneath the tree, huge lovely pine tree and an eagle is on top of the tree watching out for danger because you can't just have peace and not where, where are they now we need them right now <laughs> no, that's, that's right. right i mean that, that sounds like a great true. plan absolutely yeah so, but at least um, they brought it together and were able to yeah to come to a resolution and we're real life war isn't always the best way and they're we, still here that's the yeah, big thing they exactly. are here uh, you have the social dancers. I love the social right. dancers. They're yeah. wonderful, and you got to go see them and join in with them because they'd love to have you on that in that going around in that That's circle it. with that little movement yep. there. And, and I love that stuff. It's really good. Um, and I love your drumming too. Yes, the drumming is amazing. And one of the things that I I observed is that you have young people that are learning the traditions mm -hmm. and the and the and the the lang I don't know, is it the language? language? I mean, they, they, language the songs. I mean, they're, yep. they seem to be able to, to do that. And of course, we always have to give a big shout out to the Navajo because they helped us win World War II. That's right, right the code talkers. There were, there were actually a number of Iroquois code talkers as well um, during World War II. Okay. So that's, yeah. That so, I mean, so we think that, you know, I, I, we got it. Well, anyway, I'm just <laughs> mumbling here by myself. Okay. But, it, you, but it is fun, like you, when you mentioned the kids, because what often happens with the dancers is, is it's, you know, from babies yeah, in arms. Yeah, no, I see them out there with their little, there, little yeah. outfits on and going. Grabbing a rattle. Traditional. And, yeah, yeah, I love that. It's like, go, girl, go. <laughs> <laughs> that. 
And then um, the the roots rhythm and ale. What, wait a minute. Do they <laughs> what think, is that about? <laughs> do they do they make alcohol? No. 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 This this is really our fundraiser. We've start we started it in 2019, and it was for us it was trying to get our local community more involved in the museum and bringing people there who wouldn't maybe traditionally say they wanted to go to a museum. But it's a local band. So you throw in some uh, ale and there, there, there. And we have we have local vet, uh, craft people and. Uh, oh, so it's a it's a nice event. It's a more local. Um, yeah. but once you get there, then it's like, oh, I've never been here. I've never seen the exhibits, and this is pretty cool. Right. You know, so how yeah. do you bring people to a museum? Is get them there. Any, you gotta, any way you can. You can do it. Any way you can. You want to get them there. What do you have to give out a drawing? You know, you, you know, whatever it is. Um, I love your museum. Thank you. Thank you. I really do. And I, I have to laugh because the other day I'm, I pulled out that little corn do doll oh, you made for stuff, me. Yeah. They made a corn doll, oh, good. and it was like the white yarn yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And somebody said to me, "Oh, that's really cute." And I showed it to them. I said, "Isn't this great?" And they said, "I said, well, actually, I got it for me." <laughs> <laughs> they were so nice. They came on the show and brought me this doll with the little glasses on and everything. It was so cute. But it's a treasure of mine. I just want you well, to know that. It's, it's a treasure. It's nice to hear that. It is yes. a treasure. We've both been at this for a long time, and it's always <laughs> nice to know that people enjoy it and yeah. want to come back. No, I love you guys. I love what you do, and I, I pay homage personally to the Native Americans that have um, been so abused, mm -hmm. disenfranchised, mm -hmm. uh, put on reservations. That's why I hate the word reservations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Put there and just set aside, you know, you're there. And I'll tell you a quick story because when I was working at the, at the State Board of Pharmacy, I was talking to a person from Native land and I said, oh, I said, well, I said something about, oh, I guess I would have to classify you as a foreign. Well, because that's what I, that's what I have to look at. <laughs> I'm reading choices, what I'm right? reading. Right. And, and I said, but I don't think you're foreign. <laughs> no. He says, nope, we don't like to think of ourselves that way. <laughs> so we had a big laugh about it. But it was like, they, they, it was foreign because it wasn't, it wasn't American land. No it choice. was a foreign nation. It's like, no, we're the foreigners. That's right. <laughs> keep up the good work. Thank you. Keep spreading Thanks the word. Thanks very much. And thank Please you for keep spreading the word. Inviting us back. It's yes, yes so you're good. always welcome back. Come to I, the museum. I love your volunteer at the museum. Yeah. That's a great way of learning and getting it more. So, in touch. so much to learn. We are so um, getting into ourselves and forgetting about other cultures. And I, I mean, in Native Americans, but also other cultures. Sure. Like we kind Absolutely. of, you know, kind of go. Well, we're all Americans. We're not. No, but I think we need to celebrate, just like we did with the food, right? That's right. There's good. distinctions there. Good. Yeah. Thank really you both good. for being here. Great. Thanks. Keep Thank up the you. good work. I'm going to swing over to the Bunbury Players. Yay! Hey, Jason. Glad you're here today. I know that Garrett couldn't make it, but you're here. Yes, thank you for having me. So tell me, you do the one-act plays. Mm -hmm. Where do you get the plays? Well, in this case, it was uh, we, were, we were pretty uh, happily surprised. Uh, we put out a call for submissions uh, online and had... Gosh, something around 400 submissions. I know, there are people that write plays, you know, and I've thought about writing one, and I go, I don't even know where to start. Starting is the hard part, and then, you know, once you get something going, you can kind of refine it. Have you ever written a play? It. I have, actually. One of mine is, is being featured in the show. I knew that. Yeah, you're a playwright. <laughs> yeah, that was the leading question. I knew that. He's an, also an actor and a director as well. Yeah. But yeah, we had folks, uh, gosh, from Canada and, and, and over in the UK submit things, and I mean, we're a tiny little theater group that just started in 2020. We were so, I mean, happily surprised, but shocked at, at the amount of submissions and poor Jules and Megan on our, uh, on how, our board. How that good had were to, the plays? How good were they? They were pretty good. I, I'll be honest, I, I was about to mention you Jules and Megan. You weren't a reader. I wasn't one of the readers. I did not have that task of having to read through okay, 400 right. plays. But they, they were they well, I don't were think good. you have They're to read all of them. You have to kind of spread them around, don't you? Or does the one person read them all? No, it was it was between two people primarily. <laughs> oh, okay. And then if Even they wanted two, a second read. Each? Oh, it's a lot. Well, I mean, they had some lead Reminds up because Reminds me of the movie producer. It's like, I yeah. think I read this one before. <laughs> Yeah, but it was good, and it's always interesting because it's such a, you get such a variety. There was, you know, dramas and comedies and, and all kinds of different, you know, introspective pieces and all kinds of different stuff. So it's a really nice, it's a nice spread that we got. So how many plays did you finally select? There's going to be 20 overall. That's a lot. It's a lot. It's, we're doing it for the weekend. 
Are they um, are they readings or do you actually pr perform them? They're primarily going to be stage readings, so it's going to be fairly minimal setting and whatnot, mostly focusing because on Because then you're scripts. doing 20 of them. I mean, and divide that by three days, I mean, you'd be going like that well, if you had to change. And that's it. Time and, and to really be able to focus on the material and not have as many bells and whistles that are nice but might distract a little bit. So it's really just focusing on the material. And are any of the playwrights coming that are you that you've uh, selected? I believe so. I don't think I'm the only one. The, the folks that are in the area, anyway, I think, I think there are some that plan on attending. Um, but yeah, it's going to be, we're going to have, uh, I think three shows that first Friday night, starting at seven, uh, and probably like a 15 minute break between shows, ease into it with the first three. And then Saturday's like an all day, you know, oh, all day. I, I think like 11 shows or something that wow, day. Wow. And then Sunday we're going to have six, um, Friday and Saturday are going to be the later, like start at seven. And then, um, or I'm sorry, Friday starts at seven and Saturday, Sunday start at one. And this um, is all in Gr Gr Greenwich, right? Yep, it's right yep. at the uh, Greenwich Town Hall. Okay. Um, and uh, so really nice space, and uh, hope everybody can make a trip out to come see it. Tell me about your play. What's your play about? And if you were, if you had to, to uh, ask someone to perform it, what would you say? It. What would you say? So my play is a horror movie survival guide. Horror. <laughs> Zombie land. <laughs> a little bit in the vein of like a uh, your your classic like a uh, uh, slasher movie from like maybe the seventies or eighties, oh, okay. like your okay. Halloween type okay. thing, with a uh, has a, a narrator guiding you through sort of a top ten list of do's and don'ts for surviving a horror. Well, movie. that's what Zombieland did. What, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he roles. does that yeah. in the movie. Yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it's very very uh, comical take on on horror genre. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 and it wasn't just you. I mean, but it was like you know, it's, there's so many that that have. Um, it, but it was a great idea to pull that. So you did. So how long is your play? My play runs usually about like uh, 20, 25 minutes. I'll be curious to see. That's so a one act play would runs about a half hour. Away. Yeah, somewhere in that half hour bandwidth. And usually. how many characters? Uh, too many, if you ask the people that are trying to. <laughs> to cast things. Uh, there's a handful of teens uh, that are the, the victims, uh, the characters. There's a narrator, there's a, a monster, like of course. It sounds like fun, it sounds like a fun play. Oh yeah, it's, it's a lot, it's a, it's a fun ensemble because there's a bunch of people yeah. just kind of running around doing stuff. Yeah, so how would people get tickets and, and where are you located specifically? Well, this particular show, as we said, is, a, is in Greenwich. Um, we don't have a, a static location because we're uh, a very new group and we've performed all over wherever the place. you can get us, We're, wherever yeah, we I, can, I understand wherever we that. can find a home, yeah. Um, but the, as far as tickets, we're actually donation based, um, so there's no tickets per se. It's just you know, come on in and, and sit down and have fun. Pay what fun. you will. Pay what you will. Exactly. We're we're donation based, so you know, every little bit helps. Um, this show is going to be very uh, come and go as you please as well, because we understand that not everybody has, you know, 60 hours. <laughs> <laughs> of their well, weekend. You never strength. know. I mean, you know, if you're trying to get some ideas, you know. And oh, I, I certainly hope people come and are inspired and enjoy it. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, come and go as you please and, and uh, you know, donate what you can. And, uh, you know, the, our whole goal since we started has been to make it accessible. So, you know, both the donation and the come and go as you please makes it accessible. You don't have to sit for the whole thing. If you, you have bits you want to come see, come on down. Do you, do you have the support of the community? I feel like we do, um, although you know which community because we yeah that's <laughs> we, right. we move around quite a bit, but but yeah there's been quite a lot of support. We uh, we did a um, Zoom production for Christmas of Christmas Carol, and um, same thing with we had folks that auditioned. I think our Scrooge was in Iowa, and, and joined us uh, for a Zoom production, and so uh, rehearsals you know, must have been a little tough. It's interesting over Zoom. <laughs> That's how we started during COVID was, was yeah, doing you, public you, domain You things. just adapt it like everybody else does. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I feel like we have a lot of support. Everybody that comes out and sees the show seems to have a good time. Yeah, so you have support there. And you said that you have different locations. And obviously when, you know, and, and Garrett West is your uh, artistic dire uh, director as well, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Uh, so you have the place. Now, what other uh, productions have you done in the past? And what are you planning on? Oh gosh, so we've done, um, we started doing uh, Importance of Being Earnest and Pygmalion because they were public domain and something that could be yeah, done over Yeah, the ones that Zoom. are in public domain are wonderful because you don't have to play, pay the rights to Right, it. and we were just a bunch of theater nerds that wanted to keep doing yeah. theater during COVID, so this was a way to, to kind of have an inroad. Yeah. Um, we've done a production of Anne Frank down in, in Troy. Um, we've done a couple of cabarets. Um, 
you know, we're gearing up right now. We also have Twelfth Night getting into gear. I saw the Twelfth Night coming up. So yeah. we've got Twelfth Night coming that's up. That's Shakespeare. So we're I mean, that's that. got to be a little tough. To yeah, do. that's our first swing at that. So that'll be that'll be fun. Have you um, cast that already? Yes. Yeah. Yep. They've they've started rehearsals for that. That's good. Well, that's that's tough because you know. And of course, there is a, um, a, a Shakespeare theater uh, group too, as well. You know yes. that. Uh, oh yeah, Will Kemp players. Yeah, yeah. And they they basically do Shakespeare. Yeah, there's definitely an appetite for it in the in in the yeah. area. I think it's definitely something folks do come out for. Well, there's Shakespeare. You can't argue. He's pretty been around a long yeah. time, right? <laughs> I mean, what can you say? So you've been looking for eminent or uh, the um, not eminent domain. It's like public domain uh, mm -hmm. for plays. There there aren't that many though, because we've looked. I'm with another theater group, and we looked for like a kids' plays, and they they're kind of hard to find. They're hard, and that's why I think something like this is nice too, because it's another level of community engagement. That it's not just hey, please come see our show and and maybe you know throw some money in into the hat when we're done performing. It's it's engaging in that way too. That you know folks that. It's not just accessible for the audience, it's accessible for people that if you wrote a play and you wanted to dip your toe into the water and try to do playwriting to maybe find a venue to get it performed. You know, you, you bring up something interesting. Do you have, do you, have you done any workshops on playwriting? I mean, you know, because, uh, I mean, I would love to try and write a play. I don't even know where to start. I mean, I, I have ideas, but... I don't know, how do you write, do you write a play and always put your directions in there as to what the, the character does? Do you, you gotta put the staging? What do, what, how do you do that? Well, for me, it's very much an idea and I lean on a lot of my other theater friends because I'm the creative person but not the organized person. So I'll have the idea and I'll have you know other people that will help me look at, hey, you should put you know in parentheses here. Johnny exit stage right. Or yeah, well, that's like what that. I wondered. Do you, do, I mean, it. is that what you do? I mean, I, I think that you know, like a one act play. Am I just writing the, the, the script down, or am I really putting it all together like it's a play? Well, for me, the important thing first is like the idea, and, and like I'm a very visual thinker. So if I have the idea and I can write down, hey, I want to take through like the bare bones of a horror movie, and what happens in it. I love horror movies, by the way. <laughs> me me yeah, too. That's, yeah. That was the the impetus. Um, but, you know, I, I know that there's going to be a refinement, so I have to start with that base idea and go, okay, I've got an idea, I know, you know, generally how things are going to go, and then you just have, for me anyway, I picture it from an audience standpoint, like, okay, well, what's going to happen? Well, they can't do that because then, you know, their back's going to be to the audience half the time, or they're not going to do this or that, oh, or how are we going to do this? Oh, I see. So for me, I think about it visually, and like if I was sitting watching a play, how does that, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah, it's, it's just something I've thought about, you know, and I thought... Gotcha. I have to give it a shot sometime. Yeah, I might do that sometime. It's like, well, that's I get that on my off my bucket list, right? Of things <laughs> and on to your do. resume, you, you exactly. Call yourself playwright. So uh, once again, when is this going to be? So it's March twenty fourth, twenty fifth, and twenty sixth. Okay. At the Greenwich Town Hall, um, the Friday performance starts at seven. Um, that's when the first show should go up. I believe the last show we're aiming for it to start around. And you can you pop in like any time? Yep. Or? Okay. Yep. Pop, pop in and out. Like I said, there's going to be probably about 15 minutes between shows, um, so you'll have a chance for folks to yeah, sure. come in and out and whatnot. Um, and uh, then Saturday and Sunday the shows start at one. Um, Saturday is going to be all day. I think the last show again is going to go up at around 8:30. And then Sunday, the last show, we're aiming to start about 4.45 with the first show starting at 1. Yeah, and I, I think that, do you have a Facebook page or do you have... We do. We do have a Facebook page, um, you, so you can find us there. We, you know, we have uh, media presence on Instagram as well. Okay. Um, you have a website? I believe we are working on getting the, the website. I guess Raymond knows if there's a website. Is there a website, <laughs> Raymond? No, he didn't. No, no okay, he didn't have Lots it. of things in the works, but we do, we do put ourselves out there and have, have a presence. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's been an interesting process getting getting things going with yeah, this. I'm so glad but, uh, you finally got on the show. I know that you were scheduled and weren't able to make it that one too. time. So we're glad to have you on now, <laughs> and you're an excellent representative of the Bunbury Thank players. You. Yeah, and uh, give Garrett my regards. I will. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you very and, much for um, having break me. Break a leg. Thank Go you. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we don't want you to break a leg, Todd. Todd Slingerland is here, and he's with Wealth One. Uh, Good afternoon. Yeah, management, do you call it, or what? It's an LLC, I know that, but how would you describe your company? Wealth One is an investment. Or the company you work for. Yeah, Wealth One is an investment advisory firm. Um, okay. So we invest 
people's money on a fiduciary basis. Okay. And my role there is chief compliance officer, as well as a certified financial planner. Okay. So I, I saw you had the CFP after it, so I knew that that. that no, but what is a? Would you say the first one is uh, compliance? What? Uh, I'm the chief compliance officer. So the you, you do, is this what you do? This is what I you do. You shake your finger at somebody? No. I, <laughs> sometimes I, I, I try not too much, but uh, the buck stops with me kind of in our office when it comes to compliance and oversight. So I get to see what all of our advisors are doing with their clients, interact uh, with those folks, uh, as well as my own practice. I'm client for, facing as well as a practitioner, mm -hmm. uh, as a certified financial planner. Um, and the things that we see as it relates to our topic today of fraud and and scams uh, is is amazing. Uh, well, it's interesting, and I'll ask you a question before you 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 go into that topic. I see a lot of ads for you got to have physical gold, and I'm looking at that, and I'm saying, boy, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now you may disagree with me, and please do. That doesn't make a lot of sense. They say, well, I know I got it, and it's there, and I'm thinking you could be you could be robbed, you could forget where you put it. Um, it, there's no guarantee it's going to go up or down. It may go down. It may be that an alloy is, is better than gold. I don't know. Maybe titanium was better. I don't know. So tell me about that. Or can you comment on it? Sure. Uh, it's what we do. Uh, if I understand your question right, I think you I said, don't know what my yeah. question was afterwards, <laughs> uh, <laughs> after my, all my rambling. <laughs> I, I think you're asking us about what, what about investments and, you know, maybe taking a longer term approach of looking at them. and. Some of the things you're talking about is day to day, they may go up or down, but when we look at a one, two, three, or four year time period and give yourself that longer time horizon, uh, you take a lot of that short term um, fluctuation out of it. And really, if you're not looking at at least three years, you shouldn't be investing. You shouldn't you, be investing. You're yeah. a saver. You're not an investor at yeah, that yeah, point. Yeah. Um, but I wonder because they talk about physical gold and they talk about, you know, gold investments. Are they two different things? I yeah. mean, I'm saying this because you see a lot of ads, so I thought we'd address that right off the get-go. Yeah, gold's an interesting animal. Uh, gold you can actually own in its physical form, and gold bars and gold bullion, and, and yeah, you save it. what I want it. is a bunch of gold bars. You know? Yeah, and, and have to worry about where it is, and, <laughs> and if something happens, and all of that. <laughs> and there's a fire, and now you go, where is that gold bar? There? <laughs> yeah. or, or you can invest in the gold. I don't want it to gold. melt. <laughs> yep, you, or you can invest in the gold index. Yeah, the index is and, what I mean. and, and or even mining companies. There, there's a whole uh, lot of a different options to play okay. the gold. Okay, well, I, I didn't want to pursue that, but it was yeah. like I see all these ads yeah. and I'm going, that doesn't even make sense to me. But anyway, yeah. that's a whole other thing. Yeah. So what about fraud? I mean, how can you be defrauded? Is that the word I want? Yeah, how can, how can that happen? Nowadays, it's almost a question of how can't you be defrauded, right? Ooh. It used to be you know, them calling about your car warranty was about, oh, as, like, yeah. about as extreme as it got. Well, you'd be interested to know that fraud is up 70% in the last two years in these scams. In fact, this month is Slam the Scam Awareness I Month. I heard that, yeah. Uh, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, but yeah, it's many, many ways to, to get access to your information, uh, both personal information, financial information, and, and beyond. And people get suckered in because they think, well, first of all, I mean, like, oh, we're, we're come, the sheriff's going to come after you because you didn't report for jury duty or some dumb thing like that you know yeah. and people really what is it that we have a, a society that can't analyze that if somebody's asking for your social security number or your medicare number that there's something going wrong yeah the, the scammers prey on what we call the four p's right they they pretend that there's someone of authority that you pay attention to and and you will take notice to then they create a problem or an issue that gets your attention. It could be your grandson was in an accident, you know, that one. I'll or you, you won the lottery, that, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and then they exert uh, the third P, which is pressure. And they want you to do things right away. They're in a hurry. They're harassing oh, you. Oh, you got to do it right away. They're intimidating you. Yeah. And then eventually it gets to the big P, which is pay. They want you to pay. Some way, somehow, they want to extract cash from you. They don't want to check either. If, if they do want to check, it's in the form of a cashier's yeah, check. That's what I mean. They don't, want, they don't want anything that you yeah. yeah, They want gift cards. They want a cashier's check. They want wires. They want ACHs. Uh, they don't want you to mail them a check. Okay, so here's my story. So the phone rings, and I look, and, it's, and I'll, I'll say it's a city that my grandson lives in. And I'm saying that that doesn't make sense because 
he's got a New York phone, you know. But that's okay, I'll pick it up. Hello. Hi, Grandma. So now I'm, okay, here I go. There you go. You know, I'm ready for him, you yep. know. Oh, I says, uh, oh, yeah, what's going on? He said, well, he said, I'm in an awful accident. I said, you don't sound right. Oh, yeah, it hit me right in the face, and my nose is, and so I go, oh, is that what's happened? Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. How, exactly how did that happen? Well, I'm going down, so long story, I'm going down the road, and, and my attorney, and there's an attorney here, and I'm Bob, and I'm going to go to jail, and he's, got to, he's going, and I go, oh, really? I said, I, I don't understand, you're in Germany. How did that happen? He was in Germany. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> They hung up on me. <laughs> oh, shucks, I wanted to keep going with that conversation. But it's funny because I'll string them along, you know, if I can. If I got time, I'll string them along. Because I figure less time for somebody else to get hit right. with something. Un unfortunately, for every one person there is like you that can actually have some fun with it and, and uh, do the right thing and be on guard from the minute you're on the phone, yeah. uh, there's 15 people that they've got them. They've, They've got, they pretended to be someone, they've got that problem out there, and now they're starting to put some pressure on. Well, it's interesting, um, I've done things on fraud, uh, and one of the, my heroes is the guy, uh, out, oh, Pierogi, I think he uses his name, is Pierogi. And he does a lot of this reverse. In other words, he sets up a, a false uh, bank account, and, a false, and he lets them get into this computer that he has with all this fake information on. And he shows that what they'll do is once they, something they'll say, we gave you too much money back. Right. And so therefore, uh, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to lose my job if you don't help me out. So let's, look, can you just send me the money that I over, I, instead of giving you 500, I gave you 5,000. So can you send me 4,500 hours back to cover this or else I'm going to lose my job. And they're crying on the phone, and of course he plays the part of an old lady, you know. Oh, okay, I don't know. So then she says, uh, what, what was funny is he said, so is there a CVS or a, a, you know, a, a Target nearby? Yeah. And she says, oh, I think so. It's about you know, two miles away. And he says, well, can you go there? She says, well, I don't have a car. He's so funny. I don't have a car. Well, do you have a walker? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm listening to this. make it up. The, this guy in, in, in a foreign country is asking this old lady if she's got a walker. She can walk two miles to get these cards. Well, he's laughing, you know, but of course they don't know he's laughing. And I'm, I'm hysterical about this. But he strings them along and along. And he shows how what they do is they will, when you get that other $5,000 into your account, they've taken it out of one of your other accounts and put it in there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's amazing how... Yeah. They're very creative, and, and they've gotten better and better and more charming and more creative, and uh, the information that's out there, uh, and we want to counsel, you know, counsel, counsel people, don't put any of your information out there. Uh, the less stuff you have out there, the more opportunities there are for that dam to leak. Um, you know, something we, we talk to people about is we use a system called LexisNexis. Oh, I know LexisNexis, yeah. So, so yeah. Le LexisNexis, if we're trying to verify you, mm -hmm. and we ask you which of these four cars have you ever owned. They do that, yeah. And, and it's public knowledge, and these folks will know that. They'll go through, they'll research that's your why, That's why they yeah. say you shouldn't, like on Facebook, they'll say, well, what's your favorite car, or what's this? They ask you questions. I never, never do any of those. I mean, those are, those are uh, you know, kind of bait and Right, that's one of our chief don'ts is do, avoid social media sites that ask for things like your elementary school because they'll get your mascot or high school mascot, which is often a verifying question a lot of companies use. Um, they'll ask you- They are insidious. Yeah, they're very clever and the, and the stakes are very high and they may start with $5 and end at 5 million. And we've seen the gauntlet at our firm. It's, uh, it's amazing what they do out there. Yeah, so did you send any money to the prince? I have not sent any money to the Nigerian prince is the newest. I'm just, I'm just waiting for him to, the, what is it, the 909 9 scam? They call it the 911 scam or something. Yes. Or, yeah, yeah, the 7-Eleven, or, or there's some number. It has to do with the law in Nigeria, I guess. Yep. It does that. Oh, it's, it's amazing. We, we have clients that have been promised money from uh, physicians who were traveling overseas or mi missionaries overseas but they need to get back and they get taken for as little as five and as much as 700,000 we've had a case so and there's they get emotional they get in depth they're embarrassed and and that's one of the things that we try to say to people is if you find that you may even 
you may even remotely think you're being scammed, get an objective third party in there, a, a sister, a brother, a mother, a father, someone. You know, or even you. We have talked people off the ledge on this stuff and they still go back and give more money. Um, so sometimes people just get in too deep. Well, the romance scams are the worst, yeah. But what I was gonna say is do you see people coming to you and wanting to take $300,000 out of their account and when you ask them why? Yeah, it, it usually doesn't start at 300000 it'll okay. start at 50000 Oh, and, okay. And, and, and it'll and the last That's a big number. And then the last withdrawal will be three hundred thousand. By then, they will have taken a million dollars and depleted their account. And what's worse? But can you do? You, are you able to intervene, or do you try to, or should you? I we, don't know. We do. We intervene to the point where we ask clients, please. We think you're a victim of fraud. We think you're being scammed. Uh, move your account. We we don't want any part of this account any further. We think you're in, in jeopardy. Uh, we can't call someone they know. We can't let anyone else know. That's a problem. Um, yeah, because it's not HIPAA. Because HIPAA is the medical, but you've had the same issues with uh, finances. Yeah, so we, we would love to be able to, and in certain situations we do have, uh, notify a third party. Yeah, see, I know. I get that on mine. Do you want to notify a third party? I usually don't do that, because I don't, so, but then I think, well, maybe I should. I don't know. And, and a lot of people that our clients are... are retirees and, and aging and as their faculties diminish they're more susceptible and then they're more embarrassed if it happens to them so the likelihood of us contacting a third party becomes very very remote yeah. and, and, it, and it's devastating uh, we yeah. had a case recently where the lady withdrew seven hundred thousand dollars and it was from her IRA and she withdrew it through 2022 and now she has no money in the tax bill is due and it's it's a huge tax bill. Oh yeah, so, yeah. So because it's the yeah, gift you got to pay. Giving. You got to pay on it. So it was easy last year when she was being defrauded to, to hand this money out, but now the tax man cometh, and and there's no money left, and it's just a just. A and you can't scenario. say I don't have it because I was defrauded. You know that doesn't work. Uncle Sam gets paid, yeah. and it's really a shame. It just breaks your heart because you do everything you can to protect your clients. But you just can't. And you, well, do you enough. can't protect them from everything. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've heard is that people of uh, an older generation are more susceptible because they they believe more, and they always want to be courteous. They have that courteous thing, where it's like, oh, I don't want. See, I'm I'm not that way. I just you know blow them off. You know, have fun with it, and then blow them off. You know. Yeah. They're they're courteous. They're relatively neophytes to the virtual and online world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to get anything by my 21-year-old daughter. She's seen it, done it. Yeah. But my 81-year-old mom, maybe, but we're teaching her a lot. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is to, is awareness. And if you look at, like, the uh, some of the AARP um, publications, they will definitely, you know, try and alert people that are an AARP member, or, you know, not just them, but to kind of get them, you know, watch out for this, watch out for that. There are so many different ways that you can be defrauded. And, really and believe me, the guys up there doing it are pretty good at it. They're really good at it. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to share that with us. I have to just say who's coming on. Oh, I got my signal here. Okay, here's coming on next. In April, we have Hollis Palmer. He's an author. We've got Teresa Broderick. She's a poet and an author. The Bunbury Players are going to be back again. The Saratoga Voices, free tax preparation, yay! Harbinger Theater, Landis Arboretum, Schenectady Historical uh, Society with um, a historian. I'm sorry, Chris Leonard, Schenectady Light Opera, and I'm, I'm telling you, we've got a great show coming up. Anyway, what so a we, great show. Yeah, we do. Todd, I want to thank you so much because I think the awareness that people should understand what's going on uh, and. They're so easily defrauded, and I know of my own personal people that I know personally that have been defrauded because they just weren't alert enough. Yeah. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Good. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I think we're almost out of time. I'm Ann Pearl, your host for Capital Region Today. I produce the show, and I got a great lineup of, of volunteers helping, and I love you all. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>